Good morning, everyone. It's good to have each of you here. I want to read a passage of scripture to you before we start. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Great passage. We're not going to grow in the Lord without the strength and power of the Holy Spirit and dependence on him. We're not going to be effective in our ministry without the Holy Spirit's help. People won't get saved without the Holy Spirit's conviction and drawing them to Christ for salvation. Nothing happens without the power of God working in and through our lives. Amen. And an important reminder for us today as we uh, worship God and, and sing and study the word in a moment. Father, I just want to thank you. We dedicate this time to the Lord. I pray for those that are home today healing from COVID. I pray for those who are traveling and out of town, their safety on the road. And, and God, I just pray for us that are here today in this room and in, in the lobby, those that are watching online. And I just ask, dear Lord, today that you would accomplish your holy desires in the heart of each individual who listens to the word today. Thank you for the privilege to worship Jesus. And thank you for letting us be here this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Brother Phil. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good. Are you ready to start singing? We're not yet. Because we're going to invite some kids up. Who wants to come up and sing? It's okay. You can I saw up. that you wanted to. You can. I, can, I promise. <laughs> I was like, I saw this. Come on. You want to come up and yeah, sing? Come on. Yeah. All right. You may be wondering why we're doing that. Well, this is Kiss Sunday, right? Kids in Service Sunday. All right. So we're going to have, the, we're going to have some folks join us this morning. <clears throat> you may notice... Then I'm kind of dressed for the occasion today. I saw a thumbs up. So let me ask, is there anybody here who knows what I'm wearing? Yeah? Let's see a raise of hands, right? A portion of you, right? This was a peachy, okay? This was a pocketed folder that we carried back when I was in junior high and high school. Yeah, I know. Audrey said she saw one of these in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me if I could stand like this for a long time. So, you know, anyway, um, I thought it was fun to wear. I know that most kids wouldn't understand what it is. Uh, we liked it because inside it had uh, a times table and it had some uh, conversion charts and stuff like that. <laughs> That's how we cheated. Mm, just saying. So, so, well, so I heard. All right. Anyway. We're going to go ahead and get started, but we're going to ask you all to stand and join us, though, because I think this is going to be fun, all right? Are you guys about ready? All right. Now, you know that you can look at either one of those screens, okay, and follow the words, all right? Let me get my guitar on. Let's see if I can do this without hitting anybody, but we don't, we don't, we don't want to do that, do we? So she get in the right key too, right? Did I? Good and done. I want 
How you guys doing? Yeah, good? All right. Did you like that? Yeah, yeah. All right. You guys can have a seat if you'd like to. You guys are doing a nice job today. Normally, we have about 20 kids up here, so we're down a little bit today. Um, and every week in, in church, when, when Pastor Dan begins to preach, the kids go next door to the edge. And that's when we have a Bible lesson, we sing some songs, and we've been working on the Ten Commandments. And so I wanted to have that last song especially because, you know, someone once came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God, right, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And the cool thing about the Ten Commandments is that shows us how we do that. How do we love God? How do we love others? Well, the Ten Commandments make that pretty clear. So each week we've been working on the Ten Commandments, and, and we've been doing some hand motions. And some of you might not have been here last week, but we're going to show everybody out here how to remember the Ten Commandments, okay? So if you were here, anybody remember what the first one is? It's this one finger. Clinton, you know what it is? What is it? Okay, there, you shall have no other gods before me. There's only one God. So we hold up one finger and we say, there's no other gods before me. There's only one true God, right? How about the second one? Who remembers the second one, Valerie? 
Okay, this one is no other idols. Don't bow down to idols. So you need two fingers like this. Here's the idol. We do not bow down to idols. That's number two. How about number three? Who remembers number three? You, you remember again, Clinton? What is it? Watch your words. Do not misuse God's name. So you put your fingers here. Do not misuse God's name. How about number four? Last week's lesson was number four. Do you remember, Allison? Close. This one, think of it as a pillow. Remember? Do you remember, Valerie? This one was remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's, it's also a day of rest. So this is how you do number four. How about number five? This will be today's lesson, by the way, over in the edge. Five is honor your father and your mother. So you go, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's number five. Honor your mother and father. Number six, they had some fun with. How do we do six? You remember? This one is, <laughs> Valerie's got it. We do not murder. Oh, no, don't do that. Do not murder, right? No, number six. Number seven, you have five fingers like this, two like this, and number seven, this is five kids. This is mom and dad. Number seven is do not commit adultery. So mom and dad stay together forever. Do not commit adultery. All right, number eight. Five like this, three like this. You remember what we did? Oh, I see a couple of you doing it. They learned two ways. Number eight is do not steal. So you do this and you do not steal. And then if you do steal, what happens, Clinton? You're going to be behind bars going to jail. Oh. Do not steal. How about number nine? This one, you have one hand like this and the four fingers like this. You would place on a Bible. If you're ever in a, in a court of law, you have to promise to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, right? Do not lie. Tell the truth. And ten, all ten fingers. Ten's a kind of a tricky word that maybe we don't use a lot, but it's do not covet. Covet means you want to take. You just want everything, right? You take it all. Take everything. Okay. You want to try it really quick again? Let's do it. Number one. There's only one true God. Number two, you shall have no idols before me. Don't bow down to idols. Number three, do not misuse the Lord's name. Watch your words. Number four, remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy, right? It's a day of rest when we worship God too. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And number six, we do not murder. Oh. We'll do that. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Mom and dad, cross your fingers. They stay together forever, right? Number eight is do not steal. Do not steal because if you do, you're going to go to jail behind eight bars. And number nine, your hand on the Bible, this hand up, do not lie. Promise to tell the truth. And ten, we do not covet. We do not want all the stuff that we shouldn't have, right? Oh, nice job, you guys. Well, you probably noticed, besides the kiss that was on your chair, there was also a little note. And I just want to read that today and, and ask you to pray something for me. It says, today is a good day for a kiss, which stands for Kids in Service Sunday. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. So it reminds us to remember to pray for our kids. Pray for them as they learn about Jesus and also encourage them as they serve God. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all of these kids up here right now. I thank you for the blessing that they are to us. We're grateful that you've entrusted them to our care and that we have an awesome responsibility to train them up in the word of God. Lord, every week it's such a privilege to share the word with these kids. And I just pray that one day when each of them grow up, there'll be a day when they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to always encourage our kids to pray for them, to help them in any way we can, to encourage them to serve as they're doing today. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would just continue to be with the, the praise team as they help us to minister and be with uh, Pastor Dan as he brings the message this morning. We just thank you. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name.
Amen. That's great. You guys did a great job. Just give him a hand, right? All right. You guys want to sing a couple more songs up here? Yeah? Yeah? All right. We're going to do a couple more songs. You're welcome to stand or sit, whatever you would like to do, whatever you feel like. It's always nice to put John and them on the spot from time to time so that way you guys can see them too. All right.
in all I do. Let me honor you. Right. One more song, guys, okay?
Amen. Let's give these guys a hand, all right? Amen. Good job, guys. Please bow your head and close your eyes. I want you to be seated. Let's just pray. I want to pray for these young people here on this platform and those that couldn't be with us today. Father, I just want to thank you for these precious young people that sang and worshipped and led us in worship today. And we're serving in various ways here in our before the service even started. And I pray now, God, that they would have a heart for you as their parents teach them the Word of God and our examples to them. I pray, God, that every one of these young people would come to know Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. And that, God, they would live their life for your honor and for your glory. And I thank you for each one of them, Lord. They're so special. And uh, I just pray that their church family here would hold them up to God in prayer throughout the week, every week, Lord. And I just help them now in their life. And uh, we pray they have a great time in the edge this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for singing and leading us today. Appreciate it. All right. Let's give him a hand one more time. Clap your hand for him. Great job today. <clears throat> I have a little mission letter I want to read you real quick here, and then we're going to get started here. This is from Dave and Sarah Booth. Dear Pastor Dan, co-laborers at Grace Church in Newton. Um, Dave just found out that our church is going to double their support <clears throat> for 2022. And he says, Wow. And what a joy it is to get this email. Your support, both financial and prayer, means so much to us. It spurs us on to continue the work God has given us in Portugal. We're praying that God would provide a building for us to buy. We hope the church will be able to call a pastor to work alongside me in the future. But all these things uh, will require greater resources. But our God is providing through you and so many others as well. Know that we will do our very best to be good stewards of your giving. We are grateful for your partnership, and we look forward to meeting you in person next time we are home on furlough. May God bless Dave and Sarah Booth. That's uh, from our missionaries there in Portugal. And uh, as you know, we, we, uh, God blessed us in our missions giving exponentially this year. Uh, and so we are, we are able to double we can't double everybody's support, but we're definitely doubling the support of all those that are foreign missionaries. Uh, they're going through a whole lot of uh, stress. Uh, we've been able to also take on uh, a missionary in Venezuela, uh, Brother Dan. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting him. I haven't had a chance to actually meet him face to face yet, but loves the Lord. Uh, very difficult time there ministering in Venezuela. Um, and so, uh, I'll give you a sheet here, probably coming up in the next two weeks, a list of all of our missionaries again and the adjusted amount that we're supporting them so you guys will have uh, the, that information at hand. We're going to continue on in our Philippian study, and I want to talk to you about knowing Jesus this morning. Philippians chapter 3, we're just going to cover two verses today, and um, my prayer has been throughout this whole week that for not only myself, but for each of us, that we would just grow, grow in the Lord, mature in our spiritual life, and really grow deeper in knowing Jesus Christ. Um, you know, some of us <clears throat> uh, make New Year's resolutions. I don't know how many here in this room or out in the lobby or all those watching online have made New Year's resolutions. Uh, you probably made them at the beginning of the month. Normally you make them as you're getting ready to enter a new year. And we do this sometimes because... We want change, right? We don't like the way things are, and so we decide, I'm going to make some adjustments, and so we get on our lists, and we find out the areas that we're weak in, areas that we want to improve in, and so we set some goals. Maybe some of you here have set the goal this year to read through your Bible in 2022. That's a great goal, isn't it? To read all the way through the Bible, uh, from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, or maybe to pray daily. Perhaps you've been struggling and, and just being consistent in your prayer life. Or maybe to exercise daily, right? Uh, to run from the recliner to the refrigerator, then back to your recliner. And you've decided you're going to do that every day, right? There's some exercise that you can get in. Or to lose some weight. Uh, to read more. Or how about this one? To handle money better. To be a better husband, wife, or parent. <clears throat> and this one, to change your attitude and your behavior. 
Maybe you're having some attitude trouble. Um, I read about a guy who was struggling with his attitude. And he decided, I'm going to set this as a goal. I mean, I'm coming into a new year. I'm going to really work hard on, on having a better attitude and, and along with that, better behavior. So he found himself in a long checkout line at the airport. The airline agent was cheerfully directing people to other counters for quicker service. When she asked this guy, who just happened to be a businessman, his destination, he shouted. He was pretty upset by this time. He says, I'm going to Orange County and I'm late. And what are you going to do for me? And she just looked at her chart and continued to kind of check things out a little bit. And then he, pretty soon, in his impatience, as he kept waiting, he says, oh, great. I need help. And I get stuck with Miss Incompetent. And he started throwing out some names at her and showing a little bit of attitude. She kept her eyes on the flight sheet. And finally, she looked up at him with a big smile on her face. And she says, oh, my, I just can't. I just can't do a single thing for you. And she turned around, she walked away, and he missed his airplane flight. And I think uh, he probably learned a lesson, right? Uh, make sure you change your attitude. That was supposed to be a joke, but nobody laughed, so what can I say? That's why I'm not a comedian. That's why I read them. And sometimes they flop big time. But anyways, you know, a whopping 80% of New Year's resolutions and goals fail by the second week of February. I think probably most of them fail by the first week of January. But anyways, that's just, we won't argue about that one. But you know, if we fail to reach our goals, uh, I think sometimes there's some frustration involved. We can develop a little attitude. What's the use? Why bother? Uh, maybe we're tempted to give up and, and maybe we'll check, try to try it out again next year. But that attitude can be very dangerous, especially when it comes to the goals we set that will impact our spiritual life. You see, folks, there are times that we don't follow through with the reading of God's Word. We don't follow through with meditating on God's truth, committing Scripture to memory, taking time to study uh, and learn what God has for us in His Word. There are times we don't follow through with our prayer. There are times, like that guy in the airport, that we exhibit bad attitudes and wrong behaviors. There are going to be times that we yield to temptation and sin against the Lord. Uh, trying to live the Christian life in the weakness of our flesh is a recipe for failure. Peter learned the hard way, didn't he? He denied Christ three times. All the disciples learned the hard way. They deserted Jesus in his hour of need there at the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, perhaps you can think of times right now when you messed up in your spiritual journey and uh, you failed uh, in some area. See, growing in the knowledge of Christ and becoming more like Jesus in our character and our thoughts and our motives and our actions cannot be done in our own strength. And God's goal for our life is to conform us to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, but it's God the Holy Spirit who, who makes those changes in us. And I will add this to this, that it is our responsibility to be willing, to be obedient, and to be yielded to God's work on our life. It is God's power that makes the changes, but it requires our partnership with God. We have to be willing. We have to put forth the effort. effort. Now, Paul met Christ and trusted him as a savior on the road to Damascus. Remember we talked about this last week. His viewpoints changed. His values changed. His goals changed. God radically transformed this man's life. But it didn't stop there for the apostle Paul. Because he wanted to know Jesus in a deeper and more intimate way. And he spent the rest of his life striving to know Jesus and to experience him in a deeper way. And my prayer for Grace Church, for everybody here, is that we want to grow deeper in knowing Jesus Christ and develop that relationship we have with Him. Father God, I pray as we dig into Scripture this morning, I pray that You dig into our heart. God, Your Word is quick and sharper and more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I'm praying today that You'd wield the sword of Your Word 
and, and cut right into the thoughts and the intents and the motives of our heart, God, and expose stuff that, that, needs to, that needs to change. Patterns that we need to change. Sins in our life we need to get rid of. Things that we need to start doing. And I pray, God, that there would be uh, this, this desire in each of us to want to know you more and the effort that it takes to make that happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're taking notes this morning, your lesson sheet, notice, first of all, knowing Jesus was Paul's personal passion. He said in verse 10, I want to know Christ. It's not the same as knowing about his historical life. It's not the same as knowing the correct doctrines regarding Jesus, although that's very important. It's not the same as knowing about his moral example, nor is it the same as knowing about his great work on our behalf. It's certainly good and wise to know about the facts that relate to Jesus, to know what he taught, to know the details about his life on earth. But what did Paul mean when he said, I want to know Christ? It's a Greek word, gnosko, and it means to know experientially. It means to know by experience, to come to perceive who Jesus is and, and, and to go through life experiences together. We all know people in this life on a surface level. Uh, you may know their name. You may know where they live, where they work. Uh, you may know who they are married to or whether they are single. You know if they drive a Chevy or you know if they drive a Ford which stands for fix or repair daily. If you own a Ford, I'm just kind of having fun with you, okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, and you're not really close to the person. You just, you know them, but it's kind of like more on a surface level. And then there are those people in your life that you know really well. I mean, you spend time together. You talk about life. You go through life experiences together. You support one another. You you pray for one another, you care for one another, you love one another. And these experiences of life result in closer relationships. Those relationships result in getting to know someone closely and intimately. The Amplified of Philippians 3.10 reads this way, For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. That phrase, I want to know him, resumes a thought back in Philippians 3.8. Remember, Paul wanted a deeper and more intimate knowledge of Jesus Christ, and he said, man, compared to everything else I've valued in the past, it surpasses it. He wanted to be closer to Christ Jesus, his Lord. That same Greek word is used in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge, there it is again, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. And by the way, the word grow there in 2 Peter 3.18 is a present imperative. In other words, we're to be, we're to be continually uh, growing in our Christian journey. If you're not growing, then you're going backwards, okay? God says, I want you to grow, and I want you to grow continually. It's presented as a command here in 2 Peter 3.18. We cannot know Jesus more intimately, though, until we first, listen, trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's where the journey begins. And before Paul knew the Lord as his Savior, he wanted to persecute. He wanted to eliminate anybody who proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, his wants and his desires were totally different than that of a believer. But when he met the Lord in Acts 9, trusted the Lord, was transformed into a new man, God changed Paul's message of good works to the gospel. God changed Paul's mission of serving the high priest to serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God changed Paul's hate for believers to love for believers. God changed his wants and his desires. And now he wanted to know Christ. He wanted to draw close to him. And he wanted to tell everyone he could about Jesus Christ. This was Paul's personal passion. It was to live as Christ. To die as gain. Knowing Jesus was Paul's personal passion. Before I go to the next main point, what's your passion? There's nothing wrong with having things you enjoy doing, hobbies, 
career, sports, all these things are fine. If you like watching a football game, I, I had such a good time watching a couple uh, quarterbacks. I won't mention their name. One wears a green uniform and got beat. And I was just so excited and so happy last Sunday. Now, we can have passion for things like that, but, but do you have a passion this morning for Jesus Christ? Does your heart beat strong for Jesus Christ and loving him and wanting to spend time with him? Secondly, knowing Jesus included a powerful transformation. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Power is the Greek word dunamis, and it's where we get the word dynamite. He wanted to know the force and the miraculous power and the might of God Almighty. He wanted to experience that firsthand in his life. He experienced it at salvation. He wanted to continually experience it throughout his journey as he lived for the Lord and served God. Now, Jesus, during his earthly ministry, he exhibited power over nature. Remember, he calmed the Sea of Galilee on a couple different occasions. Matthew 8, verse 23 through 27. He exhibited power over disease by healing a woman who spent all of her money on doctors. And she had this this blood issue for 12 years. And and in a moment, when she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was healed. Power went out from Christ and changed her life. Uh, Matthew 9, 20 through verse 22. Jesus healed the 10 lepers. Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. And only one of the 10 came back to say thank you. He demonstrated power over demons. He cast out a legion of demons out of two violent, demon-possessed men. The demons wanted to know where they could go, and he sent them out uh, into a, a, a 2,000 pigs in Mark 5, 13. And they ran down a steep bank and drowned in a lake, Mark 5, 13. He demonstrated power over death. He raised the daughter of Jairus, who was the synagogue ruler in Jerusalem, Matthew 9. He interrupted a funeral procession and raised a young son of a widow in Nain, and her son was being carried to the cemetery, and Jesus stopped the, stopped the sorrow and the mourning and interrupted the funeral in Luke 7, 11 through 17. Don't you wish you could have been there to see the joy that came on the face of, those parent, of, that, of that parent? as her son was raised from the dead. How about Lazarus from the dead in John 11, 38 through 44? And here's the one that we need to remember. Jesus raised himself from the grave. I've never known anybody that could raise himself from the grave. Jesus raised himself from, from the grave, John 10, 18. Look at the verse on your scripture notes. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, the authority to take it up again. The command I received from my father. Jesus raised himself from the dead. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead in Acts 2.32. The Holy Spirit also raised Jesus from the dead. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. The power of God was demonstrated in the miracles of Jesus and the powerful resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And the same resurrection power of God operates in every believer's life. God's power did not stop at Paul's salvation. God's power was unleashed and continually worked in Paul's life, conforming him to the likeness of Christ. God gave Paul the power to resist temptation, to persevere through trials, and to be holy and to speak to others boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to know and experience God's resurrection power working through him and in him every single day. Knowing Jesus was Paul's personal passion. Knowing Jesus was included in Paul's powerful transformation. And knowing Jesus involved painful persecution. This is the one we don't like. This is the one I don't like. I like the recliner, amen? Kick back, have no trouble, serve God, everything goes well, right? Never have any conflict, never have any difficulties, just serve the Lord. Paul says, I want to know Christ. and the power of his resurrection, look at verse 10 again, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Fellowship is that Greek word koinonia. It means participation in anything. From Acts chapter 2, verse 42. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The word also means communication, partnership, distribution, sharing with others like it did in 2 Corinthians 9, 13. But Paul's talking about fellowshipping. I want want to fellowship 
and the sharing of his suffering and afflictions. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, 20? He says, remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. See, folks, when we suffer for Jesus, we are sharing in his suffering. We are at that moment in a special fellowship with the Lord because Jesus suffered as well. Now, we can't share in what Jesus suffered on the cross uh, for the sins of the world, but, but, and only Jesus could suffer that alone, but he experienced much suffering while he lived on earth, similar to what uh, many believers are suffering all over this world. He suffered when many of his disciples rejected him. How many here have experienced rejection in your life? All right. In that case, you are in fellowship with Christ because he went through rejection because many of uh, his, his disciples walked away from him in John 6, 66. He suffered when he was betrayed by Peter in Luke 22, 54 through 62. If you study the gospel of John, you'll see that Jesus looked back at Peter right when he denied him. There was that eye contact and the shame that Peter felt over his sin against the Lord. He suffered when he was deserted by all the disciples in Mark 15, 40. He suffered when he endured those six trials and was falsely accused. You ever been falsely accused and slandered behind your back? Uh, hey, he, he was spat upon. The greatest insult you could give in that culture is to spit on the face of someone. Matthew 26, 67. He suffered when he was slapped, John 8, 18, 22, and when he was mocked. Uh, in Matthew 27, 29. Jesus knows how we feel when we suffer ridicule and insults and rejection and betrayal for serving him. God told Ananias 30 years earlier concerning Paul in Acts 9, 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Paul did suffer rejection, betrayal, beatings, and with the whips and with rods, stoned, left for dead, slandered, Paul would later write to Timothy at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Paul experienced firsthand, though, through all those persecutions, the faithfulness, the closeness, the love, the presence, the strength, the compassion of the living Savior during those times of suffering. His suffering was a time to grow closer to the Lord Jesus in sweet fellowship. I'll give you a quick example. Paul and Silas sang and worshiped God and prayed and praised the Lord in a jail at Philippi, Acts 18, 25 through 31. And Acts 9, 18, verse 9, after intense opposition from the Jews, Luke wrote, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. What an encouraging word at a moment when you just got done having a battle and uh, maybe there's some fear inside. I, I got to say that why would God tell him not to be afraid if he wasn't struggling with some fear? God encouraged him, don't be afraid. Just keep on doing what I've called you to do. Keep sharing the word. You see, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Psalm 34, 18. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. There are men and women all over the world, some in prison, some who will, who will give their life for Christ. And they're being persecuted intensely. Afghanistan is on the top list of those in North Korea of persecuting believers. Many of your brothers and sisters in the Lord that you'll never meet in, on this side of, of, of life uh, uh, are suffering intensely. And I guarantee if you were to talk to them, have a moment to talk about their Christian journey, you would see the close fellowship that they have with the Lord and how sweet that is. We can draw closer to Christ through suffering as we take time to study the Word, repent of our sins, find out, you know, sometimes as we go through suffering, it's a purging time for our life too. Worship and, and prayer and trusting God completely with the outcome of that situation. Suffering is a time when God can teach us many important spiritual lessons that we really need to learn. And sometimes the only way that God can get our attention to teach us those lessons is to allow us to go through suffering. 1 Peter 4, 13, rejoice that you participate. Koinonia, fellowship. 
Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Uh, 1 Peter 4.14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Don't be angry at the person. Just thank God. Thank you, Lord. What a blessing. I didn't like what he said. I didn't like what she said. But thank you for the blessing that I took it on a chin for you because I love you and I'm serving you. Verse 16 of 1 Peter 4, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Paul learned a great lesson that during his suffering, when he was weak, God was strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 on your notes. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Remember how it was before you accepted Jesus as your Savior? You were dead. Though you were alive physically, but spiritually, you were dead. Before I got saved, I didn't want to read the Bible. I didn't want to hear the Bible. Though I was in church, because I had to be, I listened as my dad preached. It went in one ear and out the other. I had the glazed eye look. He woke me up one Sunday during the sermon when I was snored on a third row from the front. When you're, when you're dead in your trespasses and sin, spiritual things are not interesting to you. Let this be a time of evaluating your faith this morning to see if you are of the faith. Are you kind of dead when the preaching of the word is shared? Is there disinterest in ever talking with God in prayer? Is there a desire to want to live for the Lord? Do you have love in your heart for brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you want to share the gospel with others? I mean, there are certain things that happen in a person's life who is alive in Christ, but when you're dead in your transgressions and sins, you're spiritually dead. There's no desire. You're unresponsive to the Lord. Not only that, we're controlled by our sin nature. Before we trusted the Lord, look at Ephesians 2, 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world, a world system that opposes God, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, another, another title for Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. When God got a hold of your life and through the Holy Spirit convicting you as the word of God was shared, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and, and the Lord drew you and saved you. Now, after our salvation, we're alive in Christ, and, and we are living a godly life in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. This means that we are no longer dead in our, transpre- our trespasses and sins, but instead we are dead to sin. Romans 6, 2. Not only do we want to say no to sin, God has changed our wants. We don't want to live in sin. We want to say no to sin. But God has also given us the power to say no to sin. Amen? You don't have to say yes. You can say no through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Romans 6, 2, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And the word died is, it means separation. You're separated from sin's power. No longer is your master. No longer has control of your life. You're no longer slaves to sin, Romans 6, 6. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. The word attain means to arrive at or become a partner of. The resurrection from the dead, ex annotatius, it means it's the only place in all the New Testament where this word is used, and the prefix is ek, and it means out of, and it suggests a partial resurrection or out from other dead ones. In other words, Paul was looking forward to the resurrection. Believers since the beginning of the church in Acts 2 will be raised at an event known as the rapture. 
This event's going to happen at any moment. This is our theme passage for the year. Let's read it together out loud, right? It's around your notes there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Ready? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and remain are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Jesus is coming, and it can happen at any moment. And Paul was looking forward to that resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of the believers. The Old Testament saints, they'll be raised after the Great Tribulation, which is the second half of the trib, right at the very end of that tribulation, they will be resurrected to enter the thousand-year reign, millennial reign of Christ, found there in Daniel 12, 1 through 2. Uh, the tribulation believers, those saved during the tribulation, who are martyred uh, for their faith during the tribulation, will be raised at the end of the tribulation period. They also will reign with Christ a thousand years, Revelation 20 and verse 4. But all non-believers will be resurrected at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ to face Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verse 5, and verses 11 through 15. So Paul here is not doubting the resurrection of believers. He's not doubting that it would happen. He's anticipating. He is looking forward to the resurrection of the believers. So Paul had a personal passion to know Jesus, to become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him. Each day he experienced the Holy Spirit's powerful, transformative work in his life, not only at his salvation initially, but continually throughout his life. He knew suffering for Christ meant sweet fellowship and closeness with Jesus Christ. And one day he knew he'd be ushered into the very presence of the Lord. One day receive a resurrected body, safe in the presence of sin. Amen? And he'd be glorifying the Lord in heaven. So how can we get to know Jesus better? Things that we already know, okay? Coaches often go back to the basics when their team all of a sudden starts going on the skids when it comes to playing their, their games, right? How to throw the ball, how to catch the ball. I mean, simple things like that. So, first of all, Grace Church, we need to confess our sins to the Lord. Our sin breaks fellowship with Jesus. It really does. 1 John 1, 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, here's what God's word says. We lie and do not live by the truth. God is not fooled by fake facades. Pride, rudeness, bitterness, lies, deception, grudges, unforgiving heart, discord, gossip, slander, a critical and judgmental spirit, immoral heart, immoral behavior, it's all sin. And the list could go on. I could name others, but that's good enough. You got the idea. All sin, my sin, your sin, breaks fellowship with Jesus. Our spiritual growth is hindered when we have unconfessed sin in our life. And until we take care of it, we're not going to grow. Our sin also grieves the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. When I sin and when you sin, the Holy Spirit is sad mourning over our sin he convicts us and he points out attitudes and words and actions and motives that are that are displeasing to him he does this because he loves us and cares so much about us that he wants to get us back on track so that we're bringing glory to jesus christ and that is the purpose we're here on earth not only that our sin squelches our desire for the lord you ever had snacks before supper? Eat a candy, couple candy kisses here before lunch today? Hey, let's see how you do at lunchtime. You're probably not going to feel like eating very much because it curves the appetite. 
You take a couple candy kisses of sin in your life, and you're not going to have much of an appetite for the Lord. Paul said, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not have listened. You're not going to cherish the Lord if you're cherishing evil. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So our sin squelches our desire for the Lord. Sin also brings God's discipline. How many have ever been in God's woodshed receiving holy discipline from the Lord? If you have it, then you're not a Christian. Simple as that. God disciplines his children. And he does it in many different ways. And he does it so that we will produce holiness in our life. And he comes in and and, uh, you can be like John 15, the pruning process in our life. That is a form of discipline. When God prunes us, we'll bear more fruit, spiritual fruit for his glory. Hebrews 12 talks about hardships that God allows in our life to get our attention, to get us on our knees, to get us uh, looking to him again. The Lord disciplines, Hebrews 12, 6, those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. We need to confess our sins to God. There needs to be revival. I'm going to be honest with you. There needs to be revival at Grace Church. I won't share with you all that I know, all that I hear, and all that I experience. All I can say is, God's people need to get on their face before God and have a revival. Confess the sin to God. Get it out. Get rid of it. Get right. We need to confess our sins to the Lord. Hey, that's how we get to know Jesus more. We need to communicate with the Lord. Take time to pray daily. This is how we communicate with God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Ephesians 6, 18, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Every time we take time to pray, it demonstrates our dependence on the Lord and our faith. It's a great time for worship, a great time to express your love to the Lord. It's a time to get rid of sin in your life and confess it. Present your needs to God with thanksgiving. This ongoing communication with the Lord is how we get to know Jesus better. Also, God communicates to us through his word. The study of God's word every day, he communicates to us. And and if we don't immerse our minds in God's truth, get this, and here's a warning, we will believe the lies that Satan plants in our mind through a lying culture, the lies of a world system that opposes God will take us down a trail that we do not want to travel. God's word is so important. Take time in it. How can a young man keep his way pure? Psalm 119.9, by living according to the word. You can't live according to the word if you don't know what the word says. You got to know what God's love letter has to say to you. So you can take it and apply it to your life. Psalm 119, 105, your word's a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Like newborn babes, crave it. Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Finally, we need, to, we need to control the Holy Spirit to grow in the Lord. Jesus 5.18 says, Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery or wasteful living. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you circle that little word, be filled? It's in a plural because it's to all of us here. Not only to the ones that Paul was writing, but to all believers of all times. Be filled. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's also in the present tense, so it's ongoing. Continually be filled with the Spirit. It's also in a passive voice, which implies it's something done to you. It's something that God does to us when we get rid of the garbage in our life. And it's also posed as a command. It's a command given to us by God through the Apostle Paul. 
And when the Holy Spirit has control over our life, then we have the power then to resist the temptation, to persevere through trials, to, to be holy, to speak to others boldly about the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have an impact in our culture for Christ, and to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. I read a story about an elderly lady and she uh, <clears throat> knew the Bible very well, had a lot of passages of scriptures memorized by heart. Eventually, there was one verse that just stuck with her as, her, as she began to forget things quite a bit, and 2 Timothy 1.12 stuck with her. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep which I have committed unto him against that day. That verse she remembered. By and by, part of that verse slipped her mind. She pretty soon would repeat, that which I've committed unto him. At last, as she neared the end of her life, between this world and heaven, her loved ones noticed her lips moving. And they bent down to see if she needed anything and she was repeating over and over again the following words from that verse. Him, him, him. She lost the whole Bible, but one word really summarized the whole Bible. Amen? Him. Though her memory had failed, that dying saint never lost the one that she loved so well. That her salvation was based on a living relationship with Jesus Christ. He satisfied her heart's need, even in death. The only way of salvation is through the, the knowing the Savior. But folks, let me just say, knowing the Scripture is one thing, and knowing the facts and the data, knowing the stories and the details. But knowing Jesus is another. You get my point? You can have all the facts in the world and the verses memorized and know your theology and not know Jesus intimately. Let me ask this about your head and close your eyes. By the way, this lesson's for me. It's for all of us. No one, no one has reached the point of not having to read the Bible, not having to pray, not having to confess sins to God. No one has reached that level of spiritual life. It is a journey, and it requires our effort but also it requires the power of God. Amen? The same power that brought Christ out of the grave, the same power that can bring about our transformation. I'm going to ask Rebecca to play softly. Let me ask you a question. This journey begins, first of all, with knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Grace Church, smaller crowd today, but let me just ask you, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I mean, if you were... Honestly, if you were to check out today, do you know Christ? Do you have a passion for God? Do the spiritual things, the word, prayer, living for Christ, doing what's right, does, does that, is that your desire or is there just no desire for the Lord? Do you know him? Do you really know him? Do you realize that when your life ends, you are facing Christ? You will face him. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and after this is the judgment, we will face our Lord, our, we'll face our Creator one day. Do you know Him? Have you trusted Him as your Savior? You won't get to heaven on the coattails of your parents. You're not going to get there because you come to this church or you've been in church your whole life. You're not going to heaven for those reasons. You take communion, you've been baptized, you're not going to heaven. Because of that, 
It's faith in Jesus and Him alone. Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned to Christ and Him alone to be your Lord and Savior? That's where the journey of knowing Jesus begins. Everybody say, Pastor Dan, I don't know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't know if I would go to heaven to be the Lord if I were to die. I do not know that. But I would like to know how Jesus can be my Lord and Savior. With head bowed and eyes closed in this private moment. Is there anybody here say, Pastor Dan, would you pray for me? Just lift your hand. I'll pray for you. Anybody here at all? I don't know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. But would you pray for me? I'd like to know. Anybody here at all? Any teenager, any adult? Anybody here at all? Maybe you're watching online this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you'd like to invite Him into your life, would you pray with me right now? I'm going to lead you through a prayer. This prayer doesn't save you. It's faith in Jesus and Him alone that saves you. Do you believe He died for you, paid for your sins once and for all on that cross, and believe He arose again that third day? Do you believe that with all your heart and you're ready to trust him? Right now, he wants to save you. Do you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I know because of my sins, I deserve hell. But I believe, Jesus, that you died and paid for my sins on that old work cross over 2,000 years ago. I believe that. I believe you arose again that third day. And by faith, dear Lord, I turn from my life, my sin, and I turn to you, Jesus, in faith. And I ask you to save me. Take away my sins. Please come into my life. And from this day forward, I give you the care and the control of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Believers, with our head bowed and eyes closed, how are you doing in your journey of getting to know Jesus? Is there some improvements that you need to work on or some things that you need to change? You know, as your pastor, I've made some changes in my own journey. I was feeling pretty weighted by some of the things that, that I've seen in ministry. And I'm, I'm getting up much earlier now and coming in much earlier and spending a whole lot more time in God's Word and talking with Him in prayer because I need it. I need it. I need Jesus. And you need Him too. We all need Him. We say, Pastor Dad, I'm going to spend more, I want to spend more time in the Word, more time in prayer. I want to depend on God and be yielded to the Holy Spirit so I can live out this Christian life. If you pray for me that I would allow the Spirit of God to control me and work in me, would you pray for me in that area? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Father, I just pray for the Grace Church family and those who are watching today and those who are our guests. I pray, God, you'd help each of us in our journey to grow and to mature in our faith. Thank you for everything you do for us every single day. Thank you for giving us everything we need for a life of godliness. We have the Holy Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit to help us. Conviction, leading, comfort, teaching. Now we just need to Appropriate all the tools, God, that you have given us so that we can grow and get to know you better. Some of us here are going through some pretty big trials right now. God, I pray that we would take this time <clears throat> to really look to you and to grow closer to you and to get to know you better. I thank you for the church family. Thank you for your love to each of us every day and your faithfulness. And God, help us as we live our life to be faithful to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, I got a couple quick things here. There is a supper uh, this coming Wednesday, 545 to 630. We're going to have spaghetti. 
and we're also going to have macaroni and cheese for the kids, all right? And if you're an adult and you love macaroni and cheese, we'll let you have macaroni and cheese as well, all right? And uh, this is not for those watching your waistline. Uh, this is spaghetti, so anyways, but plan on that. All the classes, Wednesday Night Live, Junior High, Senior High, Foundations, Experiencing God, those classes are all happening Wednesday night, Lord willing. Uh, Grief Share is going to meet today at 4, and then also um, there's a big write-up in your bulletin on Ignite uh, Leadership Conference coming up. Um, some of you are, have expressed some interest in going, and if you want to go, the, the uh, registration, early registration is coming up here on the, tomorrow. It's a deadline on that, and then it's like 10 bucks more to the end of February, and then it's then walk-ins are even 10 bucks higher for registration. So uh, if you're interested in going, see Pastor Brian, or you can see uh, Josh and Emily Peterson, and uh, they'll get your name on the list. I, I guarantee you will not regret going. You'll enjoy it. You'll worship the Lord, have a great time in worship, learn a lot of things from God's Word. It'll be a spiritually enriching time that'll help you in your journey for Christ, okay? Hey, God bless you folks. Have a great day. Stay healthy, and you're dismissed. We'll see you.